welcome back. Uh, I'm trusting God we are all having a nice time. Praise God. I wish we all enjoy the first lecture, the gospel of the kingdom. Um, we are taking biblical survey and appreciation. On Thursday, we, uh, we look at the canonicity of the scripture. Praise God. Uh, we have been looking at this course, and I remember saying that the, our course objective, the objective of this course, the biblical survey, amen, um, praise God, uh, to understand and appreciate the Bible, to understand and appreciate our Bible, and then to prove that the Bible is inspired, is a spiritual book, inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, to also see the progressive revelation of God's master plans of redemption, and then to know how the sixth book of the Bible uh, came to us. We, it's very necessary that we know how they came to us. And we also say that the Bible is a spiritual book that contains the word of God. It was given by the inspiration of God. Uh, the Bible is a doorway to spiritual realm and manual for the journey into divinity. It is a unique book. Like we said, it defined itself as the revelation of God for the purpose of bringing man to redemption or bringing redemption to man, then we talk about the authority of the Bible. We said that the Bible contain, uh, sorry, the Bible claim its inspiration. Um, it confirms its divine authority. It also affirms itself as a special revelation from God. It has asserted itself as a word from God to man. The word of the Lord came to me. Praise God. Since the Bible claims its authority, inspiration, and special revelation from God, it must be free uh, from error and falsehood, or else it will not have been uh, uh, inspired of God. Hallelujah. So we also talk about the purpose of the Bible. We said that if we don't understand a purpose of a thing, we can't but abuse it. And the reason for the abuse of the scripture is because we don't actually know what the uh, scripture is for. I am too sure that so many people have used Bible outside its purpose. I'm too sure of that. I'm so sure that so many people have used Bible to achieve what it is not meant for. And then not even pay a little attention uh, to what it is meant for. So um, we said that the Bible, the reason for the Bible, the reason for the scripture is to, you know, guide us in our day-to-day -day living. That's the essence of the Bible. And then to bring man to, uh, to bring man to perfection. So if we mix this, we are just playing game with the Bible. Hallelujah. Then we talk about canonicity last time. We talk about canonicity last time. Uh, that was uh, on Thursday and what it is and the uh, exchange for that. Hallelujah. Are we together in the house? Uh, I don't know that what, what we actually say, how this is this book. Uh, came to us, we have established the fact that the Bible is an inspired book given to man uh, by God through the inspired authors. That means that all the authors uh, that wrote under the inspiration of God, um, the, 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 the God inspired them to write. So, so and is the inerrancy and infallibility of the scripture have been Validated, therefore, the sixth book we are in short to be inspired. 
by God. So why this canonicity? Uh, we said that after the death, resurrection, and ascension of, 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 of Jesus, uh, the church, the apostolic fathers, they found over 100 books written in testimony of Jesus and some writing, you know, and some of those writings also found uh, we are writing during the period called intertestamental period. That's uh, uh, a period between Malachi and, the, and John the Baptist. So there were writings then. Uh, amen. Praise God. So in order to present a valid testimony of the scripture, in order to ensure that what will be handed to generation will be unadulterated, pure doctrine of Christ. So the church fathers, they use standard measures by the help of the Holy Ghost to validate books that were inspired by God and separated them from those ones that their inspiration uh, is questionable. And that was a great job done uh, by them. And, you know, like we said, some of these books found were actually valuable. Uh, they contain uh, fundamental facts historically, but they were not authenticated nor approved to be inspired by God. And since the Bible is the major source of the doctrine of God, his inspiration must be validated and ensured. You know, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So the scripture is profitable. So the doctrines we have, like we said, that the tools that the fivefold are going to use to groom the saint to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The tool for the assignment uh, to bring man to the place of responding to God's will and, you know, establishing the cancer, the uh, purpose of God on earth, that tool is the doctrine of Christ. So it is of necessity that there will not be missed up or to put in something that is not of God, no matter how fine, how good it appears. Hallelujah. So that's the essence of uh, canonicity. So we said that some of this book, uh, they had so much facts, so much wise sayings, but their inspiration was uh, questionable. Like I said, I have read some of them. They are rich and provided valuable information. But since they were not included in the inspired book, I personally... Uh, kept those thoughts uh, aside. Amen. Like I said, I, I pick interest in some of them. Uh, there's one I, 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 I mentioned on Thursday. <coughs> I read the book of Jesha. I find that it was so interesting and I, I was asking myself, why is Jesha not included in the Bible? Since Joshua mentioned it in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. He mentioned about Jesha when he said the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemy. Is this not written in the book of Jesha? Uh, in, uh, I think in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18 also, 17 and 18, uh, if you read there, then David lamented with lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son and he told them to teach the children of Judah the songs of the book. Indeed, is he written, is he not written in the book of Jesha? So if this book and some other ones, why we are not there since they provided value information, why were they not written? Like I said, while I was asking myself such questions, <coughs> why was this book not written in the book of Jesha? I find out as I was reading Jesha, there's this 
power surge I experienced each time I'm reading scripture. I didn't, I, I, I was not feeling it. I'm just I'll read those books just like just literature. You know, they, 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 there, is, there is a power that follows God's word. That's why those uh, two disciples on their uh, road to Emmaus, they said something. He said, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he broke a bread, blessed it, and, uh, and broke it and gave it to them, their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So when we are opening the scripture, something should be burning in our heart. Something should be burning in our heart. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we also said that uh, uh, canonicity, uh, canon simply means measuring read, measuring, you know, a standard, something that's of a standard. So a read or a standard used to determine inspired books that made up the 66 book of the Bible we have today. So the essence of canonicity, the essence was to ensure the preservation of pure and unadulterated doctrine. To ensure that we do not have, you know, men's ideology, philosophies of men, just like Apostle Paul warned, I think in, in Colossians 2, verse 7 or 8, he said, don't be deceived by the Philosophies of men, rudiment of men that is not after Christ. And in Deuteronomy, we are warned not to plant diverse seed in our vine yard. In order for us not to have the seed of man's idea taught that is not of God. So they have to canonize the our scripture to ensure that these words are from God himself. So to ensure the credibility of the scripture's inspiration status, the church father has to carry, the, you know, out canonical text. Amen. Praise God. So, um, the test of canonicity. We said there were measures that the church fathers used to determine the books that were inspired of God. Now, such measures, number one, uh, they have to know the prophetic nature of the book. Does that book, is the book prophetic in nature? Is there element of prophecy or is fulfillment in that book? Now, the, two, the authority of God on the book. Now, they are checking the authority of God. Like, uh, you know, you, you, you go through Genesis and God said, you go through Isaiah, thus says the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. So is there validity that the word was spoken by the Lord? So these are the text, canonical text. Number three, is there valid operation of the supernatural that we are ensured that is from God himself? Number four, is the book in agreement with other approved inspired books? Now we find out in scripture that what, um, what Genesis is saying is what Revelation is also saying. What Jude was saying is what Apostle Paul was saying. So at their agreement, did they align together? And so, so these are the yastic. Then five, is it testimony of Yeshua? Is the testimony of Yeshua found in the book? Is the testimony of Jesus? Now because are uh, the entirety of the scripture testify of Jesus. Look, sorry, John chapter 1, verse 45. John 1, 45. 
And Philip said to Nathaniel, we have found him whom the scripture did write, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. The son of Joseph. So all the testimony of the scripture, Philip uh, found that Nathaniel and said unto him, we have found him of whom, uh, whom Moses in the law and the prophet did write, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So all the scripture must have the testimony of Jesus. Praise God. Then number six, like in the case of the Old Testament scripture, did Yeshua reference or, uh, or quotes from them? Number seven, amen. Number seven, um, okay, the acceptance of the book, the acceptance of the uh, of the book as God's word by the people it was primarily addressed to. How did they accept it? The people they, uh, that book was written to, how did they accept it? How did they accept it? Did they accept it as God's word? Amen. So Yeshua also acknowledged the Old Testament book as the Scripture. Also, now, the authenticity of the Old Testament book as inspired book. So how do we know that the Old Testament, those is his book, we are inspired? Then we also said that Yeshua, which is Jesus Christ, quoted from them. He quoted from them. Uh, apostle, the apostles quoted from them. Peter said, uh, this is that which Jewel said. You see now, this is that which uh, Jewel said. Uh, you see Jesus, as uh, he that believe, as this scripture said, out of him shall flow rivers of water. He was quoting Ezekiel. And the spirit of the Lord was upon me. He has anointed me. He was quoting the book of Isaiah. Now by Jesus quoting them, then we know that they were inspired. Now, do they have Messianic prophecies? Are the prophecies of Jesus there? The seed of the woman shall bruise their head. We saw that. The numbers. I saw a star from my head. Amen. The Lord thy God will give unto you a prophet like unto Moses. I know my Redeemer lived in Job. So we find the testimony, the Messianic prophecy. Is Christ the central theme? Okay, or Christ is the central theme. In the Old Testament scripture. At that point, they claim their authority from God, such as the word of the Lord came to me. We saw Ezekiel did that uh, so much. We also established that there's a man called Josephus, a Jewish historian. He acknowledged that the 66 books were also inspired by God. Then we look at the authenticity of the New Testament books, the authenticity of the New Testament book as inspired books. Number one, uh, Yeshua is a central theme of the 27 books that were canonized. The apostles claim their authority from God. They claim their authority from Jesus Christ. The revelation given to me, not by man, by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So they claim their authority uh, from God. Now, they also contain, fulfill prophecies found in the Old Testament scriptures. Like in Matthew, we saw Christ being born. Uh, we saw that in Mark. Luke and John, in Acts of Apostles, we saw Pentecost being uh, fulfilled. We saw some of the things that Jesus quoted there in other uh, epistles. There are also uh, their doctrines, praise God. They are the doctrines of these books. They are consistent with the doctrines of the Old Testament scriptures, with the Lord and the prophet. So they were saying the same thing. Number five, so they are, the authors 
reference the Old Testament books. Number six, the Council of Athenesus, AD 367, and other councils of the church fathers recognize that these 27 um, books are inspired by God. And also we see historical accuracy in those books. Praise God. Now, these are some of the things we said on Thursday. Then, today we are looking at the books that we are not inspired and why uh, they were not canonized despite that they have some fact, they have some words of um, wisdom. When you uh, read uh, Sirach, Maccabees, so many of them, they have lots of wise sayings. Then why are we not taking them as inspired book? Now you see, God is so um, you know, you know, God is so, I don't know the word to use in his operation, to safeguard, to safeguard his revelation, to make sure that another doctrine didn't enter, to make sure that what the church has is the pure doctrine. Now, the doc doctrine is a major issue in the body of Christ. Doctrine is a major issue. Doctrine is not just ordinary thing. Doctrine is life. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says your doctrine will distill like rain upon us. So what raises us, what guides us in our day-to-day -day life is the doctrine of God. So no matter how good it is, a little leaven can leaven the whole lumps. So a little thing that is not of Christ, can leaven the whole thing. That's why a careful job has to be done to determine books that were inspired of God. Praise God. So we have the Apocrypha books. We have the Apocrypha books. Praise God. Amen. So the Apocrypha books um are the, the books that we are reading during the time called intertestamental period. This is the period between the last uh, prophet, that's Malachi, to the beginning of New Testament. Praise God. So they were rejected as inspired books for the following reasons. Now these are the reasons why these books were not accepted as inspired books. <clears throat> Number one, the Jews did not recognize them as inspired books. The Jews did not accept them. Praise God. Number two, they did not claim their authority from God. In fact, Maccabees denied his inspiration in Maccabees chapter 9 verse 27. He denied his inspiration. So since he denied the uh, inspiration of the book and did not claim his authority from God, so there's no need of uh, saying that this book is inspired by God. <coughs> Number three, Historical inaccuracy. Now, some of these um, books, they have histories that are not in line or agree with the histories that are found in the scriptures. They have events that are not in agreement with the things found in the scriptures. Amen. Number four, why they were not accepted. And that is reasons why we should not accept them. Jesus and the apostles did not quote nor reference them. For instance, Jesus did not quote Jesha. Jesus did not quote Maccabees. Jesus did not quote Tobiah. Jesus did not quote uh, Book of Barnabas. 
and all of those things. So they did not quote from them. So as a result, we do not see them as inspired books. Hallelujah. Then number five, Jesus acknowledged the beginning of the old prophet from Abel and end with the death of Zachariah. So any other book from that time to the beginning of John's ministry is not recognized as inspired books. Though they may contain valid history, practical lessons, and instructions for living, they are not acknowledged as inspired book uh, because of the encroachment of human element and tendencies. Praise God. So these are the uh, reasons why some of these books we are not canonized. So they, we can't say that they are from God. So we cannot derive doctrine from them. Praise God. Amen. Now, there are some that contain wrong doctrine, that their teachings are not in agreement, such as Maccabees, who talked about um, uh, purgatory. So we now see that that ideology is not in agreement with the teachings of the Bible. Purgatory is not in agreement. There are other teachings that are not in agreement with the law and the prophet. And I want to say uh, there is no new doctrine outside the prophet, outside the law and the prophet. Any other teaching you are bringing that is not in agreement with the law and the, and the prophet cannot be accepted to be doctrine of, 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 of Jesus. So we are grateful to God for the labors of the church fathers in distinguishing and preserving the inspired books. So this work saved and served as security against error and falsehood in the church and also ensuring the right doctrine in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. So we are fully assured with audacity now we are fully assured with audacity that we have the pure doctrine of God from God himself for the purpose of building the body of Christ uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and for our day-to-day -day living. So we have scripture that is from God that we are sure that these are the word of the Lord and we can live on the basis of them. We can live on them so we can use them to teach the saint. Uh, let's see, uh, I think Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah 8, 16, let's check when he said, bind the, uh, the testimony, hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 8, he said, bind the testimony and seal my laws among my disciples. So it is the responsibility, bind, the test, bind up the testimony and seal my laws among my disciples. So we, we are not to seal other doctrine, other teachings in the disciples. That will be loving. Now because in Leviticus 2.11, the scripture stated that the offering of the Lord must be without leaven. So God does not want adulteration. God does not want a man in it. It must be purely God. It must be purely from him. So we are saying this now. Peter says, so we have a more sure word on prophecy, which we can pay attention to, and the daylight rises from our heart. So what will raise us is the pure doctrines of God. Hallelujah. So we look at the authors of these uh, scriptures, the authors of the 66 uh, books of the Bible, Amen. So the authors are spiritual men. All the authors, they are spiritual men. Called of God. And we are inspired by God to write. They did not just write. No. They didn't just write their will. No. 
they didn't just write what they felt, no. They wrote as they were inspired of God. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. He said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. No, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So they spoke, they also write as they were moved. So this author didn't write their mind. What they wrote was the mind of God. So the Bible was written. The Bible was written by, by about 40 authors of different walks of life within the space of 1,500 years. So it's amazing. So the book, the, the, the scripture was written for over the space of 1,600 years by men of different profession. Some were lawyers. Some were medical doctors, like Paul was a lawyer. Luke was a doctor. Uh, Amos was a, a farmer. Peter was a fisherman. And all of those things. So now, it's so amazing that they wrote over that time, and all of them were saying one thing. They, were, they advanced one testimony, and they had a team, and the central team of what they wrote is our Lord Jesus. It's so amazing. Praise God. Amen. So the book, this 66 book is divided into two parts, known as the Old and the New Testament. Praise God. So the Old Testament contains 39 books and the New Testament are uh, 27. In all, we have, uh, we have 66 books. Amen. We have 66 books. So the Bible is in layers. Now, what, uh, this is something that we must understand. Understand their significance, their importance. So the Bible is in layers. Now, we have... Uh, the Bible have two major layers. Two major layers. Praise God. Now, what they call the law and the prophet. That's one. Then we have the New Testament. So the New Testament itself, amen, it has about five layers. That makes it all seven layers of the Bible. So we look at the law and the prophet. So the law and the prophet is actually Genesis to Deuteronomy. Hallelujah. The law and the prophet is Genesis to Deuteronomy. They are called the law and the prophet. That's why, you know, you saw uh, where we read in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1 verse uh, 45, he said, we have found him and uh, whom the whom Moses in the law and the prophet did write. So you keep seeing that law and the prophet. You see in Acts of Apostle chapter 28, verse 23. Acts 28, 23. Can we see that? Acts 28, verse 23, where the Bible says, For a whole day, uh, Apostle Paul, we are instructing them, teaching them, showing them uh, things concerning our Lord Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophet. Praise God. Acts 28 verse 23, that's where it is. And when they have come, you know, uh, and when they have appointed him a day, there came many into his lodge to whom he expanded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both of the law of Moses and out of the prophet from morning till evening. So the law and the prophet uh, was what the apostles used, and it was what our Lord Jesus Christ used in their days. And these two layers made up what we have today as the Old Testament. And I want us to understand that all the doctrines of God are summed up in the law and the prophet. So the law and the prophet, they are the foundation of the scripture. So um, all the writers, they had no opinion outside the law and the prophet. That's why anything that is not from the law and the prophet cannot be the doctrine of Christ. 
Praise God. Amen. So in the New Testament, we have the gospel. That's the third layer. We have the Acts of the Apostles. Then we have the Epistles. Praise God. We have the Epistles. Then we have John's writing. We also have the Apocalypse. Amen. Praise God. We have the Apocalypse. Uh, these are the um, layers of the scripture. And the, these things are, they build upon itself. They build upon itself. Like I said, the law and the uh, uh, prophet, they are the foundation of the scripture. Now, what, what the prophet wrote, the prophet derived their authority from the law. That's why I said the Lord has spoken. Who can bet prophesied? The Lord has spoken in Genesis to Deuteronomy so that we are prophesying what the Lord had said. So it is a confirmation. Now, for instance, now you see in, um, um, in Genesis 3 where it says the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head. So what Isaiah said is not a new thing. Behold, a virgin shall bring forth. It's not a new doctrine. It has been said in the law and the prophet that the seed of the woman. So we now see in a Matthew, what do we see? A woman gave birth and they called him Jesus Christ. In Art of Apostle, we saw his lifestyle, his teaching demonstrated. Then in the writings of John, we saw him as eternal life. And in the book of Revelation, we saw the seed of the uh, woman crushing the head of the serpent. Now, that is to show you that, that the Bible is a progressive revelation. Now, a, a, a second instance, in Genesis chapter 3, you see the tree of of life. That's in the law. Then in the, you know, in the prophet, in Psalms, he said he shall be like the tree of life that bringeth forth his fruit. He also go in a proverb, he said that the fruit of that tree is righteousness. Then you go in Revelation chapter 22, he now shows you that that tree produced 12 manners of fruit. So it's a pro the Bible is a progressive revelation. So the authors, they say the same thing. Despite that they live at a different time, different profession, and all of those things. Hallelujah. So the essence of our discourse is for us to understand that the scripture is a progressive revelation given to us for building the sons of God to the place of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so, uh, this is where we are going to stop today. Uh, we will start again by explaining the content of the law, content of the prophet, content of the gospel, uh, content of the arts, the content of the epistles, and then uh, the content of the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless every one of us this day in the name of Jesus. Please don't forget uh, that we said that if you have questions, write them down. If you have comments, just drop it there. Praise God. We will address them as the Lord give us grace and, and the inspiration. May the Lord bless us for today's lecture in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day in Jesus' name.